So, hello everybody. Um, let me just quickly share my screen. So, sorry for that. Um, welcome to my talk uh, on um, building scaled 1 to 10 autonomous cars uh, with uh, Eclipse technologies. So, um, I'm, I'm going to Soon that, yeah. So, um, welcome. Eclipse and autonomous cars is something that's been been happening uh, quite uh, a lot recently, but not many people uh, are knowing that. Um, so, my talk today will tell you what we are doing, why we're doing, and how we are doing that with uh, Eclipse technologies, and. To show you the what, I have prepared a little video. And this is from uh, our friends uh, that have a Robocar meetup in uh, France. And uh, I'm going to play a video. Um, we found out that it is a little bit jerky, maybe because of the internet connection, but uh, let's hope that that goes well and I will be commenting on it. So uh, a lot of enthusiasts in autonomous driving are creating meetups um, and they uh, get together on a Saturday. They prepare for that by uh, creating autonomous cars and uh, then they have competitions on driving. And uh, what happens is that during the meetup, they build up a track which is randomly chosen. And then usually in the morning, um, you will have a training phase um, that uh, people will be sitting in the room hacking, making the last hex of the vehicle, usually with a little bit of a technical uh, introduction. Uh, and then um, the training in the morning for the vehicles um, start and you see, yeah, as it is with machine learning, it doesn't always work uh, very well until the um, system is well trained and you have a lot uh, of things to do and uh, consider. Uh, but during time and time, uh, your vehicles get better. And this is quite an old video. So it's several, I think it's almost two years old now. And so the cars are still quite slow. Um, if you look at them driving today, they are super fast. Uh, and uh, also they, they are quite uh, good actually. So I'm going to stop the video here. So you have competitions and, and prizes. Uh, and um, that gives you an, a little bit of an introduction on on what we are doing. So we are building robot cars um, that are scaled one to 10, and we want to experiment uh, with autonomous driving uh, on that. So why are we doing that? Just a little um, company, uh, company info. Why is uh, our company, Itemis, actually involved in these things? So we've been doing a lot of tooling and methodology for automotive uh, software and systems uh, for many years and um, a lot of you from the EclipseCon um, regular participants know Itemis, for example, for the XTEX project. So we have been doing um, tooling projects in automotive based on XTEX, EMF, etc. But obviously, um, our customers in the automotive domain are doing more and more autonomous driving uh, today. And uh, so we have to keep up to date. Um, we need to actually understand the autonomous driving domain. And what we cannot do is actually build up a real vehicle because it's too complex. We cannot drive it on the streets, etc. cetera. So um, as we are a modeling company, what you do when you can't, uh, when you have to simplify the real world, you build a model. In this case, um, it is a scaled car model. And our goals are to train our employees on the domain so that uh, our own folks understand autonomous driving better. Uh, we want to showcase our technologies. So we're not only developing some, some stuff, but we want to also bring in the things that we do for automotive to show it on the uh, small cars and to understand the technologies, et cetera, uh, where the market is actually uh, going and headed to. So, um, how we are doing that? What do you need to do, uh, to do if you want to build such a cool vehicle and play with uh, the actual car? You need to first decide on a functional scope. What, what do you want to do? And in our case, uh, that use case 
is actually split into three sub-use cases. Uh, and the top right, you see uh, a screenshot of photo that was taken at Bosch in, in Upstadt. Uh, and that is um, from the meetups that are actually held in different cities in non-COVID times. Right now they are frozen, but that was uh, in a time where we could still regularly meet. And you see uh, also from the sponsors that uh, the entire activity is not, not just a toy thing, but it's actually sponsored by automotive uh, companies. I already showed the video from Paris, which is uh, sponsored uh, by Renault Digital. Uh, there was an activity in Berlin that is uh, sponsored by Hella Aglaya. And here in Stuttgart, um, we regularly meet um, in uh, rooms that are sponsored by Bosch. And uh, often Itemis brings the pizza and the Coke. So uh, that's actually um, a very industrial uh, activity. And on those meetings, we mostly do track following racing on, on prepared tracks. Um, what we also do, if you look at the uh, left side, we're doing traffic light detection uh, to actually stop and start the car based on traffic lights. And uh, obviously, see, you see that since the car is 1 to 10, we also need toy traffic lights here. And we bought one for kids um, that's about 60 centimeters high. Uh, and the next thing that we're currently exploring is gesture detection. So for example, uh, if a policeman puts his hand up uh, and stops a car, um, we are doing uh, also that. Uh, and currently, that's, that's being done virtual right now. So you've seen uh, that we have a real hardware. And uh, if you want to go about doing these things, what do you need to do? So most people um, start with uh, a real uh, RC car as a platform, and that would be a Traxxas car. They're cheaper cars, but you need a base criteria. You need a good chassis because you're putting stuff uh, on that, um, and the car should be able uh, to handle the extra weight. And you need a precise controls of the wheels because cheaper cars usually are too sloppy and you cannot uh, really con uh, control them. And then you need to be able to put some additional sensors in it. And so um, that's uh, the Traxxas slash that you see on the slides. And that would be around 500 and, and 600 uh, euros as a base, what you what you would pay. Uh, and the next step is you rip off uh, the entire cover and rip out the default electronics to a certain degree. And then you add another electronics, uh, your own custom electronics. Uh, what you see is basically we are reusing the uh, battery of the Traxxas. Um, we are using the motor control device and we are reusing the stepper motors um, for the steering. Uh, but obviously we remove the remote control uh, receiver and replace it uh, with um, our own electronics. And that schema is basically something that you can reuse for uh, all your cars or as a basis for the cars. So um, basically what we would have is a basic computer. And I'm going to go into that in a second, what we have here. Uh, and then you need some uh, PCAs to actually control the uh, actuators because uh, either the processing power or the uh, electric current requirements cannot be satisfied by the computer and we need an additional uh, power source conversion. So short introduction on what kind of computing platforms you could use. Many people started out with a Raspberry Pi uh, to control their vehicles. Um, and that's already su sufficient for simple inference. So you could do track recognition uh, and things like that already with a standard Raspberry Pi uh, without any special uh, hardware. Um, you could augment Raspberry Pi or others with uh, USB uh, sticks. So there is an Intel neural compute stick, uh, which is um, a specific stick for doing inference. Uh, and then that, that could augment your non uh, let's say non-ML uh, machine. Uh, I think the most popular system right now is the NVIDIA Jetson Nano. It's out in different versions, um, uh, ranging from s around 60 to 70 euros to 100 euros, uh, depending on um, the available memory, uh, cameras, etc. And that's about the size uh, of the Jetson Nano. 
that you can see uh, so it's not too big uh, and you can easily fit it uh, on on such a remote control car including uh, battery etc then we would have the google coral product by by google obviously and if you want to actually uh, simulate a real automotive grade system go for the real stuff you would take an nvidia jetson xavier and that's what's actually used also at oems and um, tier ones in in the actual setup um, amazingly it's about the same size as uh, the Jetson Nano. So these are the two devices. Um, obviously different in a price, just checked it. The Jetson Xavier is um, down to 600 now uh, in euros. And um, yeah, there's something in between by, by Jetson now for 400 euros. So they have the full spectrum uh, of electronics that you can actually plug in. Uh, and once you have that set up, you're, you're good to go with all the um, software that you would want to write. So I'm going to show a little bit on how we use Eclipse projects on that. Uh, and that actually goes from the hardcore programming to the system uh, through frameworks that we use over to simulation uh, and up to systems engineering. And I would like to introduce uh, and mention a few of the relevant Eclipse projects here. So um, core programming, um, we use plain C code. Mm, if you're a little bit familiar with the topic, um, many projects use uh, ROS, Robot Operating System. Um, we um, deliberately decided against that because we want to follow a use case uh, where we simulate or reproduce what's being done on, on a production car. And ROS is not yet very much uh, used in, in production cars. Uh, we have a certain workflow where we want to deploy that on an actual C++ project. Uh, so we are not using Python on the uh, Edge device either. Uh, in terms of Eclipse, uh, obviously C++, we have a very cool project called uh, CDT. Uh, and we started out with CDT. And as you can see, uh, our set setup of development is that we use the Jetson Nano, which is mounted on the car uh, and over through a uh, wireless network. We are remote mounting uh, the device, uh, the uh, files and folders on our development PC. Uh, and um, yeah, with earlier versions of CDT, CDT, couldn't well handle um, development files on on shared drives for some reason uh, or on, on remote drives. Um, so we had to actually switch, switch to another tool. We use Slicked, Slicked it, but um, as, as a user used to CDT, we actually missed it. And now, um, as you might have seen from some of the releases, CDT 10 is released uh, and we came back to uh, CDT um, and we are quite happy with that, although for our setup, um, some of the options like uh, files for in the include hierarchy, in ignoring the binary scanner, etc., we couldn't do that through the uh, user interface, uh, but we had to tweak a little bit of the XML uh, manually. So, um, so that's basic for the basic programming. And for the next slide, uh, I need to do a little bit of an architecture introduction on how machine learning architecture in automotive actually work. I don't have the time to dive into machine learning, but um, many of you will have a basic idea of a or what a neural net uh, is. And you could um, generalize that there are two approaches in, in machine learning architecture in automotive. Uh, one is on the left-hand side, the end-to-end -end approach. So we have some sensors, camera, uh, radar, LIDAR, or whatever. And uh, all those inputs are fed into a big neural network. And then uh, out of the network come the control commands uh, for the actual actuators like steering um, uh, and longitudinal uh, acceleration, braking, etc. cetera. Um, but most approaches right now used are a combination. So for example, we might have uh, a neural network that works on the camera image, which detects objects on the scene, uh, on the street, builds a scene representation. Um, we might have another uh, neural network uh, operating on other data, detecting 
uh, cars uh, or driver intentions and uh, then the information is processed uh, in either a rule-based system or in another neural network. Uh, why am I mentioning that? Because obviously this is a large process here and here we have a lot of parallelism going on uh, and that's an important factor. So to uh, deal with uh, a, a lot of things, um, as I mentioned, uh, in the first slides, um, we didn't go for Python, but we wanted to integrate everything into C++ and uh, frameworks like TensorRT, etc. Uh, but that really turned out for uh, some things to be a pain and we wanted to experiment uh, with um, the results of the neural network very early. And so we came uh, to the question, how do we make our C++ code and uh, potential Python code talk to each other very easily because we didn't want to set up uh, a large communication framework. And then uh, we, we just had the um, traffic light detection process running in, in Python. And uh, we made use of Mosquito and Paho, which are IoT communication pro protocols and actually uh, integrated that into our uh, tool uh, or in our software. So there is a traffic light detection um, now running in, in Python uh, and it's sending information about detected traffic light, very short messages over the Mosquito uh, MTT protocol, Mosquito server. Um, and the clients have been uh, implemented with, with Paho on bo both sides. Uh, one in Python and, and one in C++. And now the um, control code written in C++ gets information if there is a traffic light detected. Um, also, we talked about the integration process uh, already two years ago at EclipseCon. So if you were interested in that, um, there is a joint talk of mine with uh, Judith from Continental, uh, which still is available uh, on YouTube. So next thing that we did, um, we had a lot of uh, parallel uh, threads doing uh, detecting steering, uh, detecting camera images. There is a large open CV pipeline. A lot of that runs in parallel. And um, in our first implementation, we actually used uh, a custom communication mechanisms uh, based on mutexes. Uh, since we are running everything uh, or we were running everything in threads, so same memory space, no processes. And um, there is a new project um, at the Eclipse Foundation called Isorix. And Isorix is now a middleware with a zero copy shared memory approach and which can easily deal with huge data interprocess communication. So um, we are in the process of uh, replacing our own uh, mutex-based solution uh, with semaphores and, and uh, home-written, home home-brewn exchange mechanism with Isorix, because then we can realize something uh, that's actually also used in the in the industry. Still, that relates uh, re um, applies to our process uh, communication, in, intra-process communication. Um, for inter-process, we are going for Cyclone DDS um, because uh, it turned out that we want also dedicated computers that deal with a specific sensor. So the RPM sensor needs uh, a lot of uh, interrupts and we don't want to clock our uh, main computer with dealing with interrupts. So um, we are building a little network on the uh, car too. And um, there we are going for uh, DDS um, implementation. So DDS is a very established um, standard by the OMG for data distribution. And uh, Cyclone DDS is the implementation that's actually uh, provided by the Eclipse Foundation. Um, and um, that will be the next thing uh, that we are using. And uh, actually, that's basically what's what's going to run on the vehicle. Um, for training um, the data, obviously, you won't, you will not, you don't have enough data on the vehicle to train uh, traffic light recognition, gesture recognition, etc. So um, that's where we're going for virtual training. 
and uh, that also needs to run in a, in a massively parallel. And as you might have uh, recognized if you're in the industry from, from the first screenshots on the gesture recognition, we're using Kala, which is an open source uh, vehicle simulator and, and traffic simulator. And um, this is not at the Eclipse Foundation, but it's one of the really, really good simulators that's uh, uh, available as open source. Um, and um, right now, um, just uh, I think it was announced yesterday, uh, there's a new project at the Eclipse Foundation called Eclipse Mosaic, which is a co-simulation environment uh, that can be used to couple uh, different simulators. Uh, and uh, we are currently investigating that um, to couple Kala uh, and, and running other components. Uh, and Eclipse Mosaic um, is intended uh, as the backbone for the entire infrastructure. So this is more for uh, learning and actually uh, validating um, the trained networks on the um, uh, in the virtual world, because that makes it uh, also easier to reproduce uh, diff uh, specific settings uh, as compared to using uh, an actual virtual setup. Yeah, and then basically um, th this is also what, what actually has been dealt with in an Eclipse working group, Open ADX. So not only does the Eclipse Foundation have um, projects that we reuse, but Open ADX um, is a group that deals with the tool chain for autonomous driving. Uh, by defining open interfacing standards for software for use in vehicle-based systems and in testing environments, because basically the setup that you see here um, in, in short um, is actually what's being used in the autonomous, uh, in the automotive industry uh, at a large scale as well, maybe with different simulators, but the philosophy uh, is, is basically the same. Uh, and then we also address the entire uh, engineering approach from requirements to logical function, software architecture, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I'm not delving into, into the details of the development process right now. I'm just going to also mention which, which tools we are doing. So as I mentioned, we are go we, the plan is to set up a full demonstrator for that. We were a little bit uh, slowed down uh, because of people's availability because of the COVID crisis. But uh, also I would like to introduce some Eclipse-based projects that are relevant for that. So we have RMF, uh, which deals with requirements, uh, implements the requirements exchange format, uh, good ex integration to uh, DOS, etc. Uh, not open source, but I think one of the most uh, important uh, also Eclipse technology based uh, systems engineering tools is Cameo Systems Modeler, now by Dassault. Um, and, and that's something that uh, I would really recommend looking in if you go to uh, address SysML. Um, not related to SysML, but again, open source and the different MBSE method is implemented by Capella. Uh, and then we have Papyro system L support. And uh, obviously we are coming from the philosophy of doing a, lit a lot of domain specific languages. Um, we, we suggest Xtex to build DSLs. Uh, to wrap that up, um, does it make sense to build such a car? How real are we or how close are we to, to the actual world with uh, these things? Um, yeah, there's a lot of commonalities. So the, the development tools that you would use to build such a scaled car are very close uh, or e even the same basically as you would do in, in a real automotive project. So we have ROS, ECAL, uh, et cetera, um, TensorFlow, PyTorch, et cetera. Everything is there. We, as you've seen, we are using the real hardware and the same uh, de um, development environments um, with the with the uh, AGX and what you learn here is basically transferable. Obviously, there are some differences, like um, there's additional development tools and technologies here that you would use uh, at the OEM and OEM or Tier One, such as Autosar, um, and uh, obviously you would have higher quality and more expensive hardware uh, with higher precision uh, in a in a real vehicle development. Um, yeah, so, um, and what, what we usually don't deal with in, in the one to 10 cars is aspects like safety and security. 
uh, you can hardly hurt anyone with such a vehicle. Um, and uh, also we are not afraid of being hacked. So um, if you want to learn further things, just contact me on, on LinkedIn. Um, I hope uh, I uh, got you a little bit interested on the topic. It's real fun to build your own car and uh, you can find ready-made instructions in the internet or do your own philosophy from scratch. So um, uh, enjoy the, the fun with do-it-yourself one to 10 scaled cars. So thank you very much. And uh, I don't know if I will be seeing something from the moderator. I'm stopping the screen sharing now. Um, yeah, so. Um, so, so dear moderator, I'm already seeing the first Q and A's. I'm just going to answer them. Um, if if uh, you see any else, please let me know. So, how difficult was the combination of all the different technologies? Um, I, I think the the most difficult thing is so so if you talk about the eclipse technologies that i just showed that was quite a breeze uh, so transferring to to mqtt building in mqtt was very easy uh, transferring to isorix was also also very easy um the most time being used was transferring downgrading neural networks that were tra uh, trained on on python on a high powered machine uh, then to other frameworks with tensor rt on the jetson nano um, that was actually something that was uh, took the most time and where we uh, had the most dead ends that we had to retract from um, but using the eclipse technologies was was quite quite a breeze that that was very simple uh, what advantages have the used technologies over ross um <sighs> I wouldn't say advantages. Um, the, the reason why we picked ROS is because uh, it was or is not yet widely used in, in an actual deployed vehicle. So ROS at the time when we started was made mainly used in the research and development department and they built their, their systems on ROS. And then when it came down to actually deploying the system on a vehicle, it was uh, there's an integration step uh, transferring it to non-ROS communication mechanisms. And uh, that's the thing that we wanted to explore. We wanted to go more for adaptive autos are which we didn't use because again uh, being being slowed down by covid um, and, and that was the the uh, decision ross has the advantage that you get a nice development environment uh, out of the box and if you want to go more on the on the functional side in terms of developing stuff and getting things running up quickly many projects are based on ross um, but as I mentioned, we wanted to, to also see the integration process, um, basing the, the entire thing on C++. Um, and, th and that's why uh, we, we didn't go for ROS. So um, that's, that's basically the, the um, yeah, philo philosophy. And, and if you go for, for what advantages or what is this, so there's a discussion or was a discussion about ROS and safety, et cetera, et cetera. So this is a quite, quite uh, a full topic of its own again. So, yeah, then um, I think there are no more questions. Um, please follow me on on LinkedIn. Get my, my best best way to contact me if you if you want to also get involved into vehicles or have uh, further questions. Uh, then please contact me on LinkedIn. I'm happy to answer any questions. <laughs>